Welcome to Super Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today we have with us Stefan Semmelroth. Did I pronounce it correctly? Semmelroth. My parents set up no one for success. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's a a cool name. I'm just trying to make sure I pronounce it correctly, right? So I'm pronouncing the L, I think. That's what I'm doing. Semmelroth. So it's not Semmelroth, it's Semmelroth. Roth. Semmelroth. Like a Roth IRA. Oh, R O T H. R-O-T-H, okay, T-R-O-T-H, but the L-T is are silent, right? Uh, they, it might have been misspelled. It's a S-E-M-M-E-L, like Semmel, Semmel, and then Roth. Okay, yeah, they put a T in there, so. Oh, that's why. Yeah, I'm so I'm happy to have you on the show. Um, you know, it's, it's worth the wait. Uh, we do this show just to kind of bring out awareness to what's out there and what people are doing and to kind of share with the audience that you know whoever comes on the show is pretty much like you and me and everyone else you know if if they did it they can do it right so yeah of um, course yeah so just to start off why don't you in your own words help us understand what you do what i do right now for work yeah like what do you do like what, what 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 is your passion what are you doing right now what is your business yeah so um we can come we can come back to my exit from the the company that i founded here in a little bit because it's been a little it it's been a fun journey and um what i do now is i lead the country's largest cybersecurity non-reseller go-to-market channel so if you look at all the different ways that people can buy technology and buy cybersecurity the 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 area that I focus on is non-reseller and it's all broker. It's all brokering. So if you think of like an insurance broker, if you think of like a boat broker, it's all commissions based all the time. And the part of the reason that I really like this industry and I, I chose this particular company to come and help lead that channel is because when you step away from the reseller channel, which has its place, it absolutely does. But when you set, step into the broker channel, it's, it moves away from sales and it moves into problem solving. You're constantly problem solving. And the way, the way our go-to-market channel works very specifically is the, the referral fee, the commission for the sale actually continues through the lifetime of, of the sale. So if it's a two, three, four, five, six year um, a purchase in those six and seventh years, we're incentivized to make sure that sale continues. Whereas resellers sometimes are not. And I believe that this channel specifically, and part of the reason that I, I like it means that we have to think long-term, right? We can't think what, not just well, what solves the problem now, but what solves the problem now and will continue to solve the problem because otherwise in the other, other route, the other go-to-market channel, you're actually incentivized to create more uncertainty. And I'm not about that life. So that was, that was one of those things that finding that this channel does exist and then doubling down and betting on a partner uh, that I'm with right now, Avant Communications, to go through and really lead the industry and to move quickly and to build the portfolio of companies that allow consultants to solve problems in the best way possible is is been phenomenal and i I very much enjoy that and i have every intention of continuing to lead the industry so it's it's a lot of fun i you know i I think you tell i I do really enjoy it and that shift from pure sales into uh into problem solving i think is going to be the needle that continues to move over and over and over again and i think it'll expand even further outside of tech and outside of security i think it'll expand into many other places because because it is it is truly the way when we look at like that shift to like the subscription model it's it's the way that people that have all like the people people it allows people people to go out and get compensated for being people people instead of compensated for just selling a thing and i think that's that's really the true power here 
Mm. So just to kind of clarify and understand better, so we're talking about cyber security and two ways to go to market with cyber security is through reseller channels, partnering with a whole bunch of firms. And the other way is is through uh, commission based that you do it through people. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. So the, the market's okay. really interesting. And you know, yeah. and and honestly, any anyone in your audience that might be listening to this, it's a really yeah. cool place to start a business. It's a really well, cool me. place to start a business. Tell and I get to enable right now. Uh, founders all day long. So St- Stefan, tell me for me, me, me myself. Yeah. I come and say, Stefan, hey. Tell me, man, like I, I have this channel, I have this show, I am adding value and, and I love adding multiple streams of income. That's the whole concept of podcasting, right? We partner mm-hmm. with people and then we, um, we help them and we help people. How, how would you incorporate what you do for me? That will kind of paint a very clear picture for anybody in the audience where they can relate to it. Yeah, absolutely. So, Shahid, for you, um, you know, looking looking at your audience, looking at you know how you market, looking at the you know the podcast that you have and some of the other revenue streams, you're already out there solving problems. Mm-hmm. You're one hundred percent already out there solving problems. And then, you know, as I as I consult with and coach people in this space, whether it's you know formally through work or I usually coach between two and 300 people a year, whether it's people that want to get into cybersecurity or people that want to go found a company or people that maybe want to take their company to the next level. I get to have this conversation quite often. So my, my question back to you would be, and you don't have to answer this yet. So my question back to you would be like, what is your ideal client profile that you're looking at? And does that match the portfolio that I have? Because if you don't, that could be a piece that, you know, you make a strategic investment on and you say, okay, do I need to change my ideal client profile? If they already match, if it's a good fit, whether SMB, mid-market or enterprise, then then the option would be, okay, how do you tell the story around what it is that you offer? And I often tell people it takes about two quarters one quarter to figure out what it is that you need to message, another quarter to start messaging and get a bunch of good reps in. And that's all planting seeds. And those seeds bear fruit in two to three quarters. And then you say, okay, cool. That's the timeline, Stefan. But where do we actually move the needle? And the the question becomes how, like when you sit down with a client and, you know, for like our MBAs out there that are building, you know, strategy or our salespeople that are out sitting and figure out what companies, like what, what keeps a CIO up at night or a, a new CEO, as we start to figure out what those are, then it becomes, okay, well, hey, client, I know you're in this market. I know you're mid-market. I know you're in this vertical. With all of that and a strategic direction, maybe you just made a big bet on Microsoft. That happens all the time, right? If you made a big bet on Microsoft, then here's three partners that will actually, you know, one's best in class, one will get the job done, and one of them you'll be, you'll be happy with. And you put them in front, and then you just run the normal sales process. And if somebody closes, then you get a commission on going through the lifetime. So it's, it's, so- it's really fun. Yeah, you're making it sound really, really fun, by the way, Stefan. Like, there's a lot of passion coming from your side on this and is getting me excited as well, right? Because when I, that's the one thing I look at when I meet someone and this podcast has been a platform for me building relationships. And you, if you've seen any of my videos and the content, you will see that it's all about connecting, right? And one of the key factors is that passion. Right, that energy level about the product, and you're definitely up there. So that's that's great. Now let's step back a little bit. You mentioned what's my client persona, right? Does it match or not? How about you share with me what type of persona would be perfect for cybersecurity? Like we can't go to a 7-Eleven, or maybe we can. I don't know. You go to a 7-Eleven and say, hey, do you need cyber? Cybersecurity. Yeah. So, it, 
and that's that's one of the big things that uh, we're seeing a shift in the market here right now because this this particular market had been focused on like directors of IT for a long time, and then. Mm -hmm. As you switch out from director of IT into security, maybe a director of security or a chief information systems officer or a CTO, or often, oftentimes even we're, just, we're seeing new board members come onto a company and they'll sit down with the director of, of IT and they'll say, how much are you spending on security? I don't think that's enough because they, that board member was at a company that got breached previously and they don't like they've got scar tissue. They don't want more scar tissue. So as we as we or look travels at travels with them, that scar tissue travels with them. Yes, it does. <laughs> oh my God! Really? So they uh -huh. it's something that they they need to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So if you've if you've ever lived through a breach, it is acutely painful. N night nightmare. Huh? <sighs> yeah, and we're actually unfortunately we're we're seeing we're seeing um, executives in the industry that have had that have had a you know a a due diligence to report that have tried to keep things under wraps and they're actually going up for, you know, potential federal prison time now. Shoot. So yeah. And that's, you know, this is, this is something that we've talked about for a long time and we're starting to see that inflection point. So not only are we protecting company revenues, not only are we protecting company reputation, but we're legitimately protecting executives from going to prison by having a good cybersecurity landscape, a good cybersecurity defensive posture, one that's adaptable and can move around. So back to your point on personas, um, each of the personas is a little bit different. And oftentimes, if we're looking at like a financial industry or an insurance industry, um, they're going to have a fairly mature program. And it's more of a transactional uh, engagement of they'll say, Hey, for this very particular thing, do you have something that could fit this one super niche? And sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. That's why we're, you know, you continuing, customize. continuing to build and customize. Um, okay. as we, as we go down, uh, down market into the mid market area or outside of the financial space. So we're talking like, you know, we're back to 95% of the market here. Um, oftentimes it is, it's a, like a CIO tag team with a director of security and maybe the CTO engaged, the chief technology officer. Hmm. And uh, when we look at the relationship with most companies between a chief information security officer and a chief technology officer, they're often at odds. And that's where, and I can get into why, but that's where anybody that's a people person that's out there right now, they know how to solve that conflict because the chief technology officer, their job is to develop code and get it into production as fast as possible. The chief security officer, their job is to secure things and go through a, a maybe, I don't want to say a slower, but a more um, uh, really applying a process instead of mm -hmm. just being out there all willy nilly. And so because of those things, what we usually see is an opportunity to rebuild a relationship and get everyone on the same page. And in the end, good security practices around code development actually mean less rework. And when you take the conversation from, we're going to slow you down getting code to, if we can prevent rework, now we go from potentially 25 cycles of development in a year to 26. And that is a, a number change that actually legitimately drives revenue because you're able to push mm. more code into production. You're able to take more features to your product. And if you're a SaaS company, man, 26 instead of 25, that, those, are, those are actual number movers. If you're trying so to go public, more code, great. So it's, it's like, you know, when you go ride a bike or a mountain bike, when you put your protective gear on like a helmet, or elbow pads and knee pads, you'll go a lot faster than you would if you had no protection. Something similar to that? Um, <laughs> each time you talk, your, yeah. your audio drops. You're, you freeze up a little really? bit. Yeah. 
Well, it's being recorded locally, so it's, it's the actual file should be good. But let me repeat: I was saying you can yeah. hear me now, okay? Though I got I got you now. Yep. Okay, good. I was saying that someone you know wears a helmet, knee knee guards, elbow guards, and goes for a, 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 a mountain bike ride. He'll go a lot faster because he feels safe than someone who has no protective gear going on a, on a trail you know what i mean it's something similar to that yeah and actually i would i would escalate that analogy so okay. i would say um if we look at a thousand mountain bikers that start yeah. at the same time and they're racing <laughs> down the mountain yeah and you make sure that everyone uh, those thousand mountain bikers have good brakes that are tested that their shocks yep. are ready to go, that their helmets are on. Service. Yeah. Now now suddenly the entire field gets better, not just that one mm. mountain biker. Yes. Makes sense. Now, Stefan. So in my case, it would be that if I come across those type of personas, it's a simple question asking them if they're protected. Do they have cyber protect, um, cyber security, um, budget, or are they involved with any kind of initiative in their company? And then kind of introduce you to them, right? Kind of thing. But what about in the audience, you know, someone who's, who has a side hustle, um, or is in business and be in the business they're in, is seeing some effects from the recession or maybe it's just slow or something, not good for them. And they hear this episode and, you know, they can do the math because cybersecurity is not cheap um, by any means. So they could probably do the calculation. It'll be really good for them. How would they proceed in getting involved with this? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we, we have training all around, We'll say the sales qualification pipeline and training of how to engage and you know some of the questions that you can ask one of those buyer personas you know broken out by each buyer persona because they are so different and their motivations are are really really customized so like a cto in a, a SaaS space is going to be very different than a cio in automotive manufacturing so um Usually one of the, the roads that I take is they often have an idea that they need more and they don't have the people, the processes, or the technologies involved. And then really what it comes down to is a build or buy decision. So, hey, company, what's on your roadmap? And roadmap? Um, what's on your roadmap? And what are you trying to hire for? And do you really think that you can find, hire, train, and retain that talent? Because if you mm. can't find, hire, train, or retain that talent, then that effort is not wasted, but you're not really seeing an ROI out of it. So it becomes and that's, costly uh, too. It does, yeah. So if you're hiring yeah. at you know somebody all in that's one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, or two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars a year, and you only have them two years, but you had a three year ROI break even point, yeah then shouldn't you have just gone and bought those services or that capability anyway? Yeah. And so that's, that's, you know, in this space, I often say it's, it's not necessarily the vendors that are competing against vendors. It's really vendors competing against two things. One, the builder buy decision. And number two, what happens if we do nothing? And that's where like those board member change outs. That's the scary part. Yeah. Yeah. Especially as a consumer, right? Like how many, Shahid, how, how many times have you gotten a letter in the mail that says, Hey, we've been breached and your user information has, has been compromised. I got about two to three in the last year and a half or so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's about average. And if you think about the risk to you as a person, that's pretty rough. So that's why we're seeing yeah, class action lawsuits against companies. Mm -hmm you know, from, from the, the consumers that got so lost. It's, a, it's an easy sale. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I'll say, I won't say it's easy. I will say it's complicated because it's still enterprise sales, yeah. but yeah. it, when, when you look at it all encompassing, 
um, you really get to help companies move the needle. Yeah. And if they can protect their profit and protect their revenue at the same time, you've just moved two needles gold. by bringing in one thing. Yeah. Now, to, to further answer your question, because you asked how, how somebody could get involved with this particular channel. Um, mm -hmm. So our website is goavant.net. And we, we work really, really hard to lower the barrier to entry. We work really, really, really hard to lower the barrier to entry and get good training and support good. for people that are trying to make this leap. And mm -hmm. oftentimes... When I'm when I'm out engaging, you know, small business owners or entrepreneurs that are or almost about to be entrepreneurs, you know, I tell yeah. them, if you're going to make a bet on you, you don't have to make just the bet on you. And like when I launched my own company, I did it the worst way possible. The worst way possible. I had no mentors, I had no experience, I didn't know the market, yeah. I'd read a couple books, that was it. And it was just yeah. pure ego. Shahid, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> no, it's not. I've been there as well, so I can relate. Yeah. So, so uh, that's part of the beauty of this channel is, you know, par the partners in this space. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll even highlight our peers in the organization. I'll say near peers because I think we're ahead of them in a lot of different ways. But um, each of the organizations in this space does a good job making sure that we can train our constituents making sure that we bring relevant training. And of course, as, as the guy that builds and provides a lot of that training to, you know, to my cohort, to my peer group, to my, um, the, the, the consultants and sales and brokers out in the field, I like to say that I do a very good job and better than my peers. I'll let them vote with their dollars on who actually is better. But we spend a lot of time um, tailoring our content, making sure that we take something that is, um, as the, the industry has really perceived to be incredibly wickedly complicated and distill it down to the actual needles. And what I tell people in this space all the time is people, process, and technology. And in security, you look at security practitioners, they tend to be wicked good at technology and they tend to be very mm. weak at people and process. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's going to start a company out here that's listening to this is probably very good at the people portion. So if you're good at the people part and your buyer persona is bad at that, you become an extension of their team. You become their go-to resource, whether you happen to have something in the portfolio or not that's going to solve the need for them right now. And I find mm -hmm. that the more often you're you know, back to people fundamentals, the more often you're candid and transparent and you say, I don't know, but I got a guy. And then sometimes you go through that whole chain and you, you have an answer and you say, you know what? Turns out I don't have a meaningful way to, for you to move that needle. You build trust and confidence by saying no. More often than not, I'm working my butt off to make sure you can say yes in a meaningful way. But yeah. if I can't help you in that and you can say no, you've still helped them move the needle because they can go through and they say, hey, I've, I've gone this route. I've gone this route. I've gone this route. And no one is doing this in the industry right now. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's excellent. When did you start this again? When was this launched? Um, <clears throat> Avant itself has been around since, um, oh, gosh, were we like, I think 2013. Um, don't okay. quote me on that. You know, <laughs> we'll cut that out. Um, yeah. <laughs> Avant's been around for uh, for quite a while, and I sold my company to a trusted advisor, to one of those in the field consultant salespeople mm. uh, organization, mm -hmm. and that's how I found out about the industry. I did not know about this industry prior to that, and then I saw what the industry was doing. I saw the go-to-market strategy. I saw the way that we operate and how much you can truly build trust and confidence in a very quick way. And I said, I want to do that and I want to move the needle. So I actually, I came to Avant. I approached Avant and I said, I believe that you're the market leader in the space. I believe that you are the most adaptable 
partner in the space. You're the biggest leader. Let me take this to the next level. So I, I came in and I actually, Amazing. I, I pitched my go to market strategy to Avant yeah. during, during the interview process. And I said, Hey, let me build oh, nice. this. This is what I want to build for you. Let me build this. And uh, yeah, eventually I wore them down and they said, yes. So we're, we're, uh, we're in phase two. We're about to launch phase three and it's, it's going well. Oh, that's amazing. Great work. Thank you. So what would you, what would you say your innermost superpower is that got you to this point? Oh, oh man. Um, I'd say grit and, and I'd say grit probably because, you know, I'm, I'm in the box in the way that I reflect myself and I look at my own self. Um, so I'll say, you know, if, if we go back pretty far, I grew up uh, spending weekends and summers on a family farm and it was, you work from the time you wake up until maybe you get like an hour to chill out before you go to bed. You just work hard. And so that was instilled in me early. And then, you know, in school, I scored pretty well and good grades that got me into West Point. Um, you have to, you have to continue being an athlete. So scholar, athlete, warrior, scholar, athlete, and then, um, getting back up again when you not get knocked down is has been my superpower. So whether nice. it's physically getting knocked down, like getting punched in the face, or you know taking a big spill, or um, you know in in Afghanistan, uh, I found some pretty rough things in Afghanistan, and you know things that reshaped my worldview. And that knocked me down, you know, with post-traumatic stress. And so getting back up from that was huge. And then, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, whether you're going up for venture capital, which I did not, I self-funded, I bootstrapped, um, or you're going out and, uh, you know, you're trying to, trying to close your first marquee logo. You hear no, 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 no. Mm. eventually you're going to get a yes. Yeah. And so just being prepared that first time you get a no, you're like, ah, the second time yeah. you hear a no, ah, man, oh, we got another one. Third time, no. Fourth time, no. Fifth time, fifth time you hear a no, you've probably already exceeded your, your personal network and you go, how do I go to market now, right? I'm out of referrals. Yeah. What do I do? And then yeah. you figure it out and you go until you get a yes and you get that first yes i gotta tell you man when i was uh, when i was launching my company um i'd burned through all my cash i'd burned through everything i was i uh credit cards were about to 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 bounce like i was looking at my mortgage statement and i was going i'm not sure what i'm going to do with this um and then li literally at a conference trying to figure out where i'm going to go to dinner because i don't know what i can afford like i think i can maybe get the ramen on the street corner <laughs> maybe and uh you know it was at that point where i like i was i was down to like two weeks of cash flow and then um i got a notification on my phone that my first uh first deal came through and it was a twenty thousand dollar check and it hit my account and i was like all right i'm going to dinner like i can eat now and nice. just having having that confidence and working through that uncertainty and uh, and building out people, you know, network of people that you can trust and rely on, had, was, was huge. And it it was literally yeah. down to two weeks of make or break. And fortunately, in that valley of death, my cash flow problems weren't problems anymore. And then uh, and then you just keep driving. And then you know, awesome. as you go through and you you know you have an exit, which I I did. I had a fairly good exit. Was pretty excited about it. And then you don't know once you have an exit that thing that you built it could die. Or it could flourish. You don't know. And so all of that roller coaster and integration and liaising and then the secondary go-to-market strategy, um, mm -hmm. you'll get knocked down and get knocked down and get knocked down. And then just having that faith and confidence in yourself and self-trust. And mm -hmm. you know, ego helps. But and being able to say, yeah, that fundamental belief that we will succeed. And it's not just mm -hmm. I will succeed. It's we will succeed. We will succeed. Mm -hmm. yes, getting up. Excellent continuing to get after it and then just messaging to the world that, Hey, we're going to win. And then mm, believing excellent. it going out and then you speak it into yeah. existence. 
Yeah, speak it into, feel it and speak it into existence. Amazing stuff, man. <laughs> this has been a great, great interview. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming on our show. Um, you know, it's, uh, I live for this stuff, learning from you guys and, and seeing what you guys are creating in the, in the world of entrepreneurship. And it's amazing, like what your story is, sh what you share in your story is that most people go through, you know, and some people stop at that point. But you find that the ones that keep going and have that persistence, have that belief, eventually, you know, they reach somewhere, right? But the, the point is that you, you don't want to give up. You want to keep going. And you definitely showed that. And, and it looks like you're, you're headed great places. Um, thank you so much again. If you have any final words you want to share with the audience, please go ahead. Yeah, I, you know, I do. And if you don't mind, I'd like to speak to the people that are considering entrepreneurship. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. Yeah. So, so anybody out there that happens to be listening to this, that is th t thinking about taking the plunge, you're going to do it. You're going to make it happen. You will speak it into existence. The question is when, and it doesn't necessarily have to be tomorrow. Do your analysis, do your homework, build your plan, burn the candle at both ends. And then the hardest part is figuring out how much analysis do you need to do? before you launch? And the answer is, it depends. Don't paralyze. It absolutely depends. Yep. We don't yeah. want to get into analysis yeah. paralysis. So yeah. do you need a 60% solution, a 40% solution, an 80% solution? If you're trying to get a 100% solution, you ain't never going to start shit. <laughs> mm. So figure yeah, out- Perfection. Fi figure out what it is and then get after it and watch your cash flow. Take the plunge. Awesome. You don't need my permission, but you have my permission to go out and succeed. Amazing, Stefan. Well said, my friend. You're like a, you know, one of those top public speakers. Well said. You got probably got so many people all pumped up right now, you know. So, audience, thank you so much for being here. Everything that you need from Stefan in regards to how to contact him will be in the show notes. Um Check his, his stuff out. Check his website. Contact him. Um, they have uh, programs on their website. You can get more information about what's going on. Hopefully, we've shared uh, some some of the information, right? But at least it gave you enough to kind of um, make a decision whether you want to go ahead and look into this or not. And if anybody out there that is a CFO or anybody that's involved in a corporation, Stefan is your man. He's a top guy. So check him out. And again, love you guys. Thank you so much for engaging and um, being part of this show. Uh, we grew from pretty much nothing into what we are today and it's only because of you guys and I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you and thank you, Stefan. My pleasure, here to help.